Hi everyone, my name is Eric Rozalowski and I'm starting out with our first lecture here in Astronomy 322. Our topic today is going to be Observational Astronomy. Uh, this is the video that you should watch to go with the readings for the first week of the course. Now, we're going to get started here by talking about the beginning of the textbook and an introduction to observational astrophysics. Now, our course here in Astronomy 322, we're going to do something a little bit different than what you might have seen if you've taken Astronomy 320. You don't need to take that in this course, but in Astronomy 320, we cover a lot of stellar astrophysics, and that course is intensely theoretical. You can derive the properties of a star from first principle. It's amazing that you can just write down all of the basic physics and come up with a model of what a star looks like. However, in Astronomy 322, we don't have a nice clean model for galaxies and galactic evolution. Instead, what we're going to be doing is really focusing on observational astrophysics. And indeed, the entire study of astrophysics is a dialogue between the observational side of the field and the theoretical side of the field. Theory proposes models which we can then test against observational data to determine whether the universe as a whole agrees with the model that we're predicting. This is very different from experimental physics. We can't build black holes in a laboratory and hope that our galaxies work out. Instead, what we're going to do is just use what we see in the universe as our full data set and evaluate models against what we actually see. Now, to do this, we have to make one fundamental assumption, and that is that the same laws of physics are going to operate throughout the visible universe. And by a law of physics, I mean something like Coulomb's law or the laws of gravitation, where they behave here and across the universe using the same basic physical properties. It, uh, Coulomb's law depends on the product of two charges divided by the distance between those charges here, all the way across the universe. The coupling constant, that 4 pi epsilon naught at the beginning, may change. We have no problem with that, but we say that it must depend on the product of the two charges here and elsewhere and not the square of the first charge plus the second charge or change its physical form. So that's our main assumption, but given that, we can tell what turns out to be an absolutely wild story about uh, the universe and kind of where, how we can actually deduce the evolution of the universe from its very earliest stages to what we see here today. And this course focuses on how we use the observations to build up and form a dialogue with the theory of galaxy evolution. Now, since we can't go out into the universe and explore active galactic nuclei, ionization regions, uh, the intergalactic medium, what we have to do is we have to infer the presence of all of these different parts of the universe based on the information that arrives here on Earth. And the way we're going to do that is using these particles that we call messengers. And in this course, we're going to primarily focus on light, which is the messenger of the universe that talks to us, uh, brings information here at the speed of light. We'll also learn a little bit about particles and some gravitational waves. Light is uh, our bread and butter for observational astronomy. While other things are coming online and giving us new insights into the universe, light remains the key to studying the universe. We have a huge amount of information produced in light. Objects readily emit it. Any accelerating charges will produce electromagnetic radiation, and we will observe that here. Uh, we are primarily concerned about light as it moves through a vacuum, and so in doing so, uh, light moving through the vacuum holds this fundamental relationship. It's an electromagnetic wave or consisting of electric and magnetic vectors that self-propagate itself through the vacuum, and it follows a dispersion relation, which is a relationship between the wavelength and the frequency of that light uh, that says that the speed of light is equal to the wavelength of the light times its frequency, where C is going to, for our purposes, be three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, almost invariably treated in a vacuum.
Now, the different wavelengths and frequencies of the light, they're equivalent. When I say wavelength, I can always figure out a frequency. These are separated into these things that we call wave bands that make up the different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And I'm sure that if you're watching this video, you've probably seen a graph that looks a little something like this, which divides the electromagnetic spectrum into its primary wave bands. Uh, these are all equivalently the sh uh, running from the short wavelength, high frequency end of the spectrum over here to the long wavelength, low frequency end of the spectrum over here. And we put this into broad categories of light, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet light, the visible radiation right here in the so-called middle of the spectrum, uh, infrared, microwave, and radio wave observations. And these graphs here illustrate the different uh, wavelengths and frequencies that correspond to those regimes. These boundaries between wave bands are loose at best, and very few people have hard boundaries to certain bands, with one exception, and that is the visible light. That is set by our biology, and the visible wave band runs from about 400 nanometers on the short wavelength end to 700 nanometers on the long wavelength end. And that's just what we can see is the visible. Uh, but we often observe into the ultraviolet and into the infrared in about that, uh, in about that portion of the spectrum. Now, light also has an energy. And we can think about the energy of a wave that arrives at us, and we'll deal with that in a little bit of detail. But light, uh, thanks to the miracle of quantum mechanics, uh, can behave as both a wave and as a particle. And so we call these particles of light photons. So you're probably familiar with the idea of what a photon uh, is. Uh, but for our purposes, we think about the energy in a given photon as related to its frequency or its wavelength using Planck's constant. Planck's constant is this value here, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And we can always calculate what the energy of a photon is if we know its frequency or its wavelength. And uh, any one of these will give us the other uh, two quantities. Now, it turns out that it's really useful to think about the energy scales of light in terms of units of EV, which is short for electron volts. And 1 EV is 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. This is a very useful unit because that's about the characteristic scale of energies that atoms undergo. So the electronic transitions of atoms that give us spectral lines that we observe typically have a characteristic energy of electron volts. So what we can do is we can use that and calculate and find out that the photons here at one end of the spectrum, this is very red light in the visible, um, we can figure out uh, what the energy of a single red photon is in electron volts applying these, uh, applying these equations. So we can go back and just say that the energy of a photon is h times nu, which is its frequency, but we have units in wavelength, so I'm just going to substitute in the dispersion relationship that we have and say that that's equal to hc over lambda, and I'll plug in 6.633 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds for h, c will be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and then I'll plug in the wavelength, which is 700 nanometers, or 7 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. And if I evaluate that, uh, thanks to the miracle of having a calculator before I actually gave this lecture, it gets to be about 10 to the 2.84 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And you'll notice that's about the characteristic energy scale of an electron volt. Uh, so we can take that energy and do the conversion of 2.84 times 10 to the minus 19 uh, joules, and I'll write down the conversion factor is that one electron volt is 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 uh, joules. The joules will cancel, and if I evaluate this, I get 1.77 electron volts, uh, which is about the characteristic energy it requires to excite some bonds in, say, a neon atom. Now, 
I'll bring up this fairly trivial example to point out that it's an interesting feat of uh, numerics that if you convert the combination of constants, hc uh, has a value up here in uh, meter, kilogram, second, or SI units, uh, but it also very usefully for us has a scale of 1240 electron volt dot nanometer. And I can do the exact same problem by just saying that E is HC over lambda, and that's 1240 EV dot nanometers over 700 nanometers. And that gives me, shockingly, the exact same answer, 1.77 EV. Uh, so it's just one of those useful fun facts to know and tell that HC is 1240 EV nanometers. Very useful for a lot of our optical astronomy and infrared astronomy if we need to understand the energy scales of photons. The other things that come to us from space are other types of particles. You have your photons as light, but we also receive a bunch of particles from things like the solar wind. Now the solar wind is the outer layers of the solar atmosphere that are being pushed outward at high speeds towards us uh, and arriving here at Earth. The magnetohydrodynamic churning of the upper solar atmosphere drives these particles into our own uh, planetary magnetic field, which cascades into the polar regions and gives us beautiful aurora during the winter. But from the perspective of astronomers, this isn't super useful. These are coming from the sun, and so they're not intrinsically telling us a ton about the rest of the universe. In contrast, there are these things that we call cosmic rays. Now, cosmic rays travel at much higher speeds than the solar wind, but they are largely the same particles. They are pro relativistic protons moving close to the speed of light, and something in the galaxy or beyond is accelerating them up to uh, very, very close to the uh, speed of light. These are Lorentz factors that can be approaching billions or trillions uh, of times the rest mass energy being accelerated towards us. So these cosmic rays uh, give us some insights about the nature of the particle accelerators, and we receive these protons here in the uh, solar system. We know that they must be relativistic. There are probably lower energy particles that are accelerated. But only the relativistic particles can get to us in a reasonable amount of time, and only the relativistic particles can penetrate through the solar magnetic field to get here into uh, the inner solar system where we detect them here on Earth. Typically, we detect uh, cosmic rays by direct detection. They go through a particle detector, or they collide with the upper atmosphere and produce cascades of light through Cherenkov radiation, as well as high energy exotic particles like uh, pions that, and muons that arrive here uh, on the ground. So the figure here on the right is a plot of the uh, density distribution of cosmic rays as they arrive here on the planet. This is measured in a unit of flux, much more on flux later, as a, a factor of particle energy. And if these are protons, which have a rest mass energy of 10 to the 9 eV, uh, you're seeing that there are particles out here that are landing in 10 to the 19 to 10 to the 21 electron volts, which, to go back to uh, SI units, is 100 joules, which is pretty substantial for a single particle to be hitting our Earth with. The other big particle that we uh, focus a lot on, much interest lately, are these things called neutrinos. So neutrinos are light neutral particles that are produced through the weak interaction. Uh, they are wonderful because they move uh, through matter with very little absorption. So they are incredibly difficult to detect, but they do give us insight into the most opaque buried regions in the universe. The first application of neutrino astrophysics was solar neutrinos. And what we saw here was the neutrinos from the thermonuclear fusion reactions at the core of the sun. And these particles travel directly to us at, clo at close to the speed of light and uh, were able to tell us what's happening in terms of fusion right now in the center of the sun. It takes light 10 million years to diffuse out from the center of the sun, but we see the immediate 
effects of neutrinos uh, as a probe on what nuclear uh, activity is going on in the sun. And similarly, we also see uh, supernova explosions and other things are directly probed through neutrinos. This is a large corner of the research apparatus here at the University of Alberta Department of Physics using the neutrinos as astrophysical probes and also as a way to gain some insight into fundamental particle physics. The latest addition to the multi-messenger uh, queue is gravitational waves. Now, these gravitational waves come from uh, the orbiting of two massive bodies. Uh, usually these have to be very dense objects that are undergoing rapid uh, orbits. Usually they're black holes or neutron stars, these ultra-dense stellar uh, mass or larger objects. Uh, and when they go around and orbit each other, the masses moving through space and time create distortions which then carry away energy and propagate through a wave uh, propagating through space-time itself. Uh, these propagating distortions cause the system to radiate away energy. The objects will then fall towards each other, spiral in faster, and you end up with this so-called chirp phenomenon where they spiral in uh, kind of cataclysmically, collide with each other, and merge. Uh, the beginnings of gravitational wave astronomy was studying black hole mergers, where we saw uh, large black holes uh, colliding together. But I'll be honest, two black holes hit each other and become a black hole. So there's very little electromagnetic radiation and not much influence on uh, galaxies as a whole. But what is critical is what happens when two binary neutron stars merge together through this gravitational wave phenomenon. We had our first real detection of this uh, back in 2017, this event, uh, GW170817. Uh, this is the date on which is detected year, month, and day. And so this gravitational wave detection uh, was consistent with two neutron stars colliding with each other uh, and producing an event that was called a kilonova, which was visible in the electromagnetic spectrum. And so this was really a triumph of multi-messenger astrophysics, where we saw gravitational waves and we also saw electromagnetic counterpart. And uh, by deeply studying these binary neutron star mergers, we've built up a story where this is the source of heavy element fusion. So this is where we get the heaviest elements in the universe, your uranium, your lead, gold, all of these things come mostly from binary neutron stars. And so by studying and capturing this event, it really sealed off and gave us a great uh, conclusion on a lot of lines of astrophysical research. And so we are seeing more and more of these multi-messenger events paired with gravitational wave detections. So the next thing to talk about is uh, how to actually quantify some of these uh, observational aspects of uh, astronomy. Uh, we're going to talk mostly about the quantification that we apply to light. Light is our primary messenger. Almost everything we study here is going to rely on describing light. And there are many ways to describe the light that we see here on Earth, and then how we relate it back to the physical properties of the emitting object. The light is quantum, the amount of light we receive here on Earth is quantified in terms of flux. Uh, the flux of the light is the amount of received energy per unit area here on Earth, and that's related to the object's luminosity. So the luminosity is the total power radiated in electromagnetic radiation from an object, and it's measured in units of watts. It's just a straight power, that's how much energy uh, per unit time an object is radiating. Uh, when that uh, radiation propagates out and we catch it in a detector, uh, we care about the amount of power that we receive per unit area, and so this gets us to our flux. And we can relate the luminosity to the flux of the received light in terms of something called the inverse square law of radiation. So that's uh, the inverse square law here. Uh, and it relates the flux, which is given by uh, the variable f, 
to the luminosity divided by 4 pi d squared, where d is the distance from the source to the observer. The geometry of that is this 4 pi d squared is the surface area of a sphere with radius equal to the distance d. And when I take the total luminosity, that radiates out spherically or isotropically, meaning the same in all directions, and it gets smeared out over this sphere of surface area 4 pi d squared. So the flux received is just L over 4 pi d squared. And so as we are farther away from an object, we receive less and less flux of light because that radiation gets spread out. And that's what this figure over here is showing, where there's a source S, and these are showing the individual light rays as they get spread out and the number of light rays hitting a little unit of area uh, spreads out and gets thinner and thinner as uh, you uh, get farther and farther from the source. We then turn that um, flux that we receive into the total power that a telescope can detect using this relationship here, where we say that the power is equal to the flux times the area, where A is the size of the detector or the collecting area, uh, usually of a telescope that's catching the light here. And so we can ask basically how much power will a telescope receive from a given source? We have an example of that coming up. Now, the flux of light is a very coarse product, a very coarse product. It doesn't tell you anything about the type of radiation that we received. So now we have to combine the flux that we receive with a function of its wavelength. And so we actually care about how much electromagnetic radiation do we receive per at different wavelengths or different frequencies and this gives us a great deal of insight into astrophysical objects so flux by itself the, there's no specification of where in the electromagnetic spectrum you're making these observations to describe that we have to introduce a new quantity and that quantity is the flux density so flux density is uh, basically the amount of flux per unit uh, of the spectrum. It can be per unit wavelength, in which case we will use this little characteristic f sub lambda, or it can be unit per unit frequencies. And so there we use a characteristic, uh, the, the, the variable f sub nu. And much like any density function, this only makes sense in turning it into a physical quantity if it gets integrated. So a mass density, uh, it doesn't actually have any physical meaning. It's only when you integrate a mass density over a volume to get a mass that you get a measurable quantity. Uh, similarly, uh, the flux density only makes sense if I integrate it over an interval of the spectrum. So we can relate the flux density to the flux using an integral relation, which basically just says if I take the flux density and I integrate it over the spectral unit, um, in this case of frequency, from nu1 to nu2, I get a flux. And that flux is dependent on the shape of the flux density spectrum, and it also depends on the bounds of the integral that you're considering. If I take the same spectrum and integrate over a larger bound, I'm going to get more power. In this course, we'll use a special astronomically uh, relevant flux density unit, and that's called the Jansky. Uh, Jansky was one of the first uh, radio astronomer, and so there's this unit named after that person. And so Jansky uh, has a magnitude of 10 to the minus 26 watts per meter squared per hertz, and that's that per hertz that indicates that it is a density and it's intended to be integrated. So this is an example of something that is a plot of a flux density. Uh, this is a star specifically. Oh, there's no reason to keep it a secret. This is the star Vega. And this is a plot of the flux density of the source as a function of wavelength. 
Now uh, you have f sub lambda over here, and then we have the wavelength, and then it has this weird uh, shape. And this weird shape is telling us a lot about the astrophysics of the source. These spectral lines here are the spectral lines associated with hydrogen. We have a bunch of other lines here that are associated with other elements in the atmosphere of the star. So we're seeing a great deal of physical information. There's this overall shape to it. It's kind of most lights coming out up here at 3,800 whatever these units are. Huh. And what, what, what's, in, hmm. Well, we're getting into the fact that we start to see some weird units in astrophysics. Now, for historical reasons, astronomers love different unit systems. In particular, they really love the centimeter gram second, or CGS system here. And so that gives us some insight as to what this erg per second per centimeter squared is. And an erg has units of 10 to the minus 7 joules. It's just a force times the distance in centimeter gram second units, and that turns out to have a factor of 10 to the minus 7 associated with it. This other unit here is called an angstrom. Uh, and so I should probably write that out. It's an A-N-G-S-T-R-O umlaut M. And it uh, has a little uh, circle on top of the A. Uh, so this is named after an early spectroscopist. Uh, and so one angstrom has a unit of 10 to the minus 10 meters, or uh, a tenth of a nanometer. So, ah, well, we need some insight. Uh, this is 4,200 uh, angstroms, and so this is 420 nanometers. Oh, this is right in the middle of the visible. Well, not in the middle, this is the blue, and so this is uh, the edge of the visible uh, light right here. And so from that way, that is optical or visible light. Okay, so we are going to see some weird units here. Um, it's 90% of astronomy is weird units and strange conventions. And so part of this is letting you see behind the curtain and learning how to unpack and determine uh, those units uh, and how to do calculations with those units. So let's actually put this to the test and we can ask a very practical example of we're trying to observe Vega here. Uh, using a telescope with a circular meter and a dia uh, with a diameter of 8 meters uh, between this wavelength interval, 4195 to 4205, so right around here, uh, we want to understand and ask, well, how much light will that, what's the power that would be received from this source? And the key to this problem is that this is a narrow uh, wavelength interval. And so I can express the flux as an integral from lambda 1 to lambda 2, f lambda, d lambda. And I can approximate that integral as a uh, flux density measured at the center of that wavelength interval times the width of that interval, where lambda naught is going to be the average of the two wavelength bounds, and then delta lambda is just going to be lambda 2 minus lambda 1. And so this is 4200 angstroms, carefully chosen to be, you know, cute and nice round number. And then delta lambda here is going to be the interval here, well, also a nice round number, 10 angstroms. Okay. And so from here, we're actually able to carry out a little bit more of the problem by referencing this spectrum and saying, aha, well, this is, uh, read across here, uh, the wavelength, uh, the flux density at the central wavelength is, uh, it looks about 2.5 times 10 to the minus 9, or per centimeter squared, per second per angstrom. And then I can calculate what the total power is as of a flux, not the flux density, but the flux times the area. And so that is just going to be uh, the f lambda times delta lambda 
times the area. And now I think we have everything we need. Well, we should note that the area, it's a circular telescope. And so its area is pi d squared over four. And uh, so now we can plug in our numbers and get out an answer. Oh, hopefully in watts. Well, might have to do some conversions for that. So let's see here. We have 2.5 times 10 to the minus nine erg per second per centimeter squared per angstrom times uh, the delta lambda. That's the 10 angstroms. Uh, that'll cancel things out. Brilliant. Uh, times the area of the telescope. And I look at that and I see that I have uh, an area here in centimeters squared. So I'm going to rewrite the telescope area in terms of centimeters. So my units will cancel out. And so it's 800 centimeters in diameter uh, divided by four. And if I calculate all that out, I get a uh, lovely answer of 1.25 times 10 to the minus 2 erg per second. And then I can convert that by noting that uh, 10 to the minus 7 joules is 1 erg. And so then that's going to be 1.25 times 10 to the minus 9 joules per second. And that's a watt. And so that's 1.25 nanowatts. Done. Okay, now you'll notice that I have been trotting out the flux density in terms of wavelength and the flux density in terms of frequency. And you might think that these are just equivalent, but these do not have the same value. Uh, and the reason for that is, again, this dispersion relationship. So we do have the relationship that in corresponding wavelengths of frequency and wavelength so that you know if we have uh, the difference between one wavelength and another and we figure out the corresponding interval in frequency so if we consider the same intervals the flux density uh, times that interval in frequency space is the same as the flux density times that interval in wavelength space but there's this pesky inverse relation if we have the frequency new and we can express that as uh, c over lambda. And so if I consider the differential d nu by d lambda, that's c over lambda squared. So uh, take, noting that the interval in frequency is going the opposite direction, so it's getting larger while wavelength is getting smaller, uh, that uh, will we we'll take care of this minus sign. We have the relationship that the flux density in wavelength space, so f lambda, is equal to f nu times c over lambda squared, or I can just replace that as lambda, uh, nu squared over c. So this is kind of important because we do, if we do want to convert from one flux density in wavelength to a flux density in frequency, we have to multiply by this factor, this c over lambda squared or this nu squared over c, to make sure that we end up in the right units. Uh, they have different units, one's per unit wavelength, one's per unit hertz, so we do have to carry with us all of those uh, factors. So watch out with using flux densities. The subscript is important. Now, flux densities are a kind, rational, sensible unit. Um, that wouldn't be astronomy if we uh, stopped there. Instead, uh, astronomers often like to express the flux or the flux density of light in terms of these quantities called magnitudes. And a magnitude system is a system that was developed by Greek astronomers, and rather than leaving history in the past, astronomers have designed a system of units that is back compatible with Greek astronomy. And Greek astronomy looked at the brightest stars in the sky and says, oh, all the bright stars are first magnitude, and then the next brightest stars, those will be second magnitude, and then the third brightest stars, those will be third magnitude, and down to fifth uh, magnitude stars. So there were five magnitudes in Greek astronomy. And then we have two immediate problems. Problem number one is that the magnitude system is backwards. So this means that bigger numbers on the magnitude scale, one, two, three, four, five, correspond to progressively fainter objects. So bigger numbers, fainter objects. Uh, the 
less obvious problem is that these were categories made with eyeballs. And eyeballs are logarithmic detectors of light. Your neurological response to light is the logarithm of the flux that it receives, proportional to the logarithm of the flux you receive. So if I increase the brightness by an order of magnitude, your eye perceives that as slightly brighter, not a factor of 10 brighter. And taking the Greek astronomy measurements and putting it on a semi-rationalized scale, we developed uh, the magnitude system. And this is the definition in the magnitude system. It says that the difference in magnitudes between two objects, and it's always a relative measurement, the difference in magnitudes uh, between two objects is negative 2.5, the negative means backwards, uh, times the logarithm, there's the log property of the eyes, of the flux or the flux density ratios, as long as there were over equivalent units. Uh, the 2.5 is a value that was picked so that the actual physical scale that's somewhat rationalized corresponds to about what the Greek scale uh, developed. Fortunately, uh, we're moving away from this relative system of measurements, and we have established something called the AB magnitude system. And the AB magnitude system states that uh, for an AB magnitude, uh, it's minus 2.5 log 10 of the flux density, here F nu, uh, reference to a value of 3,631 janskis, which turns out to be about the flux density of vega in a visible band. So it turns out to be about the right uh, value to uh, give us equivalent uh, magnitudes in uh, the optical and in this AB magnitude system. So I should mention that the zero point for uh, uh, the magnitude scales is usually chosen to be Vega. It's one of the main reasons that I secretly picked the star in the previous uh, example. Uh, so the zero point uh, for the, star, uh, the system is Vega. So Vega in most magnitude systems is defined to be zero magnitude. So just to give you a little bit of a feeler for what a magnitude problem looks like, uh, I can compare two stars. Star A has a magnitude of 3. Star B's flux is 10,000 times that. What is the magnitude of star uh, B? So we know that uh, magnitude of star B minus the magnitude of star A is negative 2.5 log 10. Uh, times the flux of star B over the flux of star A. Okay, uh, we also know from the problem that FB is equal to 10 to the 4 times FA, and we know that magnitude of A is equal to plus 3. So now we can solve for the magnitude of B is the magnitude of A minus 2.5 times the log base 10 of 10 to the 4 fa over fa and then that cancels out and that's good because anything inside a logarithm or any transcendental function like sines tangents exponentials those things have to be dimensionless so that's good cancels out it's just 10 to the 4 log base 10 of 10 to the 4 it's math i can do in my head i know that that's 4 so this is equal to subbing in plus 3 minus 2.5 times 4, that's 10, 2.5 times 4 is 10, uh, so 3 minus 10 is negative 7, and there it is. So a more negative number, brighter object. Uh, so smaller number, brighter object. Okay, uh, so that makes sense. Magnitude calculations are largely that over and over in different uh, forms. Now we can also uh, consider the inverse square law of light in terms of the magnitude system. So the absolute magnitude is the way that we indicate something is kind of an absolute quantity corresponding to the luminosity or the specific luminosity of a given source. So specific luminosity is the luminosity per unit wavelength or frequency. Uh, so the absolute magnitude just corresponds to uh, a luminosity. And the way we establish the absolute magnitude system is to say it is the apparent magnitude of a source that is located at a distance of 10 parsecs away. You might ask, what's a parsec? It's a convenient unit of distance that we will motivate in well, about a week's time. 
uh, you should know uh, eventually that one parsec is 3.09 times 10 to the 16 meters. So big is uh, that because you know space is big so we need a unit that's appropriately big for space okay so we can go to the absolute ma uh, the magnitude definition and i'm going to use a variable big m to indicate the absolute magnitude uh, this will almost never get confused with the other thing we use m for which is mass uh, so we can say that we consider the difference between the apparent and the absolute magnitude of a uh, object is 2.5 times log 10 flux relative to the flux at 10 parsecs. That's the uh, flux that corresponds to the absolute magnitude. And if I go ahead and I use the inverse square law, uh, which says that the flux that says that the flux is the luminosity over 4 pi d squared. Uh, the luminosity is the same for the star, so that'll cancel out, and it leaves us with the distance scaled to 100 parsecs. And so if I express the answer in units of 10 parsecs, and I use the rules of logarithms to pull that two out, uh, and flip the exponent, or flip the fraction inside the logarithm, I get that the difference in magnitudes uh, here is uh, something that is just the logarithm of the distance relative to 10 parsecs. And because of that simple relation, we call this difference, the difference between the apparent and absolute magnitude, is often called the distance modulus, because it only depends on distance, at least in the framework that we have so far. And the final thing that I want to talk about in terms of light and observations is uh, the black body spectrum. And now you've probably heard of a black body uh, in your previous physics courses, and we're going to call black bodies uh, also, we'll call them thermal emitters. And they have these characteristic properties that uh, hotter objects tend to be bluer. So the hotter an object is, uh, the more uh, blue it's, um, uh, peak is, and so it shifts, uh, as I he heat it up, it shifts to shorter wavelengths, uh, and also it is brighter, sort of relative, the intensity increases as the uh, temperature increases here. Uh, we can actually, and we will need to, quantify that a lot. And for our class, we can use the relation that if we say, if we have a spherical, thermal, or black body emitter, with a radius of r, and I'm looking at it from a distance d away, uh, I can figure out what the flux density of it is based on the Planck function. And the Planck function is this b part, b nu or b lambda, and they are different because of the uh, spectral density arguments that we gave earlier. Uh, and we can relate uh, the flux densities of those two quantities in terms of the a geometric factor that looks a lot like the inverse square law, and then the Planck function, which is this large complicated beast of an equation here, uh, which uses a bunch of physical constants, adding in Boltzmann's constant, which is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. So let's get started with uh, the Wien law and the Stefan Boltzmann law. The Wien law is a statement about the maximum of the spectrum, which tells me where the flux density is the brightest. Uh, I can consider that in either wavelength space or in frequency space, which are the corresponding peaks of the flux densities in those domains. And there are these specific physical relationships that are specified by the physical constants in the uh, in the uh, Planck law. And so that gives me the relation uh, that you see here. The, it is inversely dependent on temperature, higher temperature, shorter wavelength. And so that corresponds to what we saw where the black body curve was brighter in the bluer part of the spectrum for hotter objects. Similarly, the uh, frequency increases uh, the, of the maximum increases as the temperature increases. So there isn't this inverse relation, just higher temperatures, higher uh, peak, um, higher peak frequencies. If we integrate uh, this awful expression here over uh, frequency or wavelength respectively, 
uh, turns out to be a very exciting integral, uh, we arrive at something that's called the Stefan-Boltzmann law. And so the Stefan-Boltzmann law uh, gives the integrated luminosity over all wavelengths and all frequencies in terms of just a single constant uh, times 4 pi r squared uh, times sigma sb times t to the fourth. And the Stefan-Boltzmann constant is 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared per kelvin to the fourth. So you can just uh, plug in the radius and the temperature, they'll cancel out the units, and they'll give you the total luminosity of an object. But as I said, I was really pretty excited about trotting out the flux density relations to do uh, an analysis, since that's something you probably haven't seen as much before. And so to do that, I'd like to work out this example, where we consider a thermal emitter, which is just what we call a black body, uh, with a temperature of 10,000 Kelvin. And we want to calculate the emergent flux of light, which is the flux per unit area at the surface of the object, uh, on the interval between 390 and 410 nanometers. And uh, we can want to express our unit in, in our answer in watts. Now this is uh, a, a, a lot of calculation, so I kind of want to walk through some tips to make sure that you get to a sane answer because this is a very easy formula to have go poorly. Uh, when you do the calculator entry. So the first thing is that we benefit from having a tiny interval again. So we are once again going to approximate the flux as the integral over wavelength of 2 f of lambda d lambda. We're going to once again approximate it as the flux at the center of that interval multiplied by the width of the interval. And so we're going to take the center wavelength to be 400 nanometers. And we're going to take the wavelength interval to be 20 nanometers. OK, so uh, from that, we're going to uh, go ahead and uh, work with our equation here. Uh, we're going to further assume that the radius is equal to the distance because we're considering just the surface of the object so the distance from the center is the radius of the object all right so from here we will uh, just do substitutions into the Planck equation which is this monstrosity right here now in working with this equation, I recommend that you work with the exponential term first. Remembering what I said a little earlier in this lecture is that that has to be a dimensionless quantity and you want to just kind of calculate that. So I'd work with first this bundle of uh, coefficients. Now, because I'm uh, a pedant, I'm going to write this all out uh, from here. So we're gonna say that the, ooh, the flux is equal to f of lambda times delta lambda and i'm going to write that out as pi and i'm going to write that as r squared over r squared that's the emergent flux part that i'm calculating times 2 hc squared over lambda to the fifth times e to oh, all brackets x which is just the exponential hc over lambda kt minus one all raised to the negative one power times delta lambda. And that delta lambda is the 20 nanometers there. So let's get uh, going with the actual calculation uh, in the bracket. Uh, so we'll do two pi times, I'm not going to write out the numbers for, the co uh, for all these constants yet, because I'm going to be working inside the bracket. So it's exp of uh, 6.63, times 10 to the negative 34 joules dot seconds times 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second all good stuff that we know uh, over lambda which will be 4 times 10 to the minus 7 meters I have to convert to MKS units or SI units uh, times that Boltzmann constant 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 uh, joules per Kelvin times the temperature, which is 10 to the 4 Kelvin, uh, close bracket, minus 1. All raised to the minus 1 power times delta lambda. And when I calculate all of this, this reduces to the incredibly complicated number of 
3.60, 3.60, which is nice. So then I can do e to the 3.60 minus 1 and then invert it, and that entire expression comes into this prefactor, which now I'll write out the rest of my expression 2 pi times 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules dot seconds times c squared, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second squared all over 4 times 10 to the minus 7 meters raised to the fifth power. And then when I grind out that number, that's 0 0.27, oh, sorry, 0 0.02799 times 2 times 10 to the minus 8 meters. And if I substitute all of these values in, this pops out as 2.05 times 10 to the 7 watts per meter squared. So 20 megawatts for every square meter of a thermal emitter, which is a lot of power. So this uh, gets us to the end of the introductory material. I hope that this sort of lays out uh, some of our foundational concepts and we'll explore them a bit more in details next week. Uh, so use this and your readings to tackle the content quiz and put in any questions that you still have remaining from the video or from the readings and we will spend our time together working to resolve them. Until next time.